Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Come on, happy Friday. We made it. Okay, so joining us today are two critical members of the President's economic team and cabinet, CEA Chair Cecilia Rouse and OMB Director Shalanda Young. They need no introduction and have joined us in the briefing room before. And so I'm gonna keep it short, but a couple of things I do wanna say at the top about the two of them. Chair Ross has led the Council of Advisor for two years as of Sunday. This is her third tour of duty at the White House, and she previously served as Dean of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. She is also the first black woman to be CEA Chair. Director Young has similarly led the Office of Management and Budget for almost two years. She previously served as the Clerk and Staff Director for the House Appropriations Committee and knows the Hill and appropriations as well as anyone, maybe better than most. Shalanda is the first black woman to be OMB director. You may be sensing a theme here. <laughs> Stick with me for a second. But I do want to take a moment to note the historic nature of the moment that you see in front of you right now. All three of us are historic first in our roles. The first black woman to serve as CEA chair, OMB director, White House press secretary, the first black women right in front of you for all of those three important, important key roles uh, in the administration. Now that did not happen by accident. It takes, it's, it, is, it's, it is thanks to this president, President Biden's leadership and commitment to building an administration full of the best and the brightest. And I am so proud to be standing with two of the best and the brightest in this administration. So with that, I will turn it over to Director Young and also Chair Rouse. But Thank you. How do you follow that? <laughs> um, just to pile on just a little, I have to thank Cece Rouse. This is probably our last time we're going to do this road show together. And if you've ever talked to Dr. Rouse, you know uh, that she's an economist extraordinaire. Which, what you may not know uh, is that to many of us, she is a colleague uh, that will be hard to replace, uh, and I will miss uh, our working relationship, uh, and I'm embarrassing her because uh, I did not tell her I would do this. Um, but I think when you've been of service, uh, you have your kids don't see you a lot. Uh, it's worth taking a minute just to say thank you. Uh, and I know the president uh, will have much more to say later, but I, as a colleague, just want to say thank you for your uh, friendship. Um, and just in case you all didn't see, the president rolled out his budget, his third one, <laughs> on yesterday, uh, and it's built around four key values. Uh, first, giving families more breathing room. What does that mean? We're talking about lowering prescription drug costs, lowering health care costs, lowering housing costs, lowering college costs, and lowering child care costs. Um, and if you have a child in daycare anywhere around here, you will understand why families need that breathing room. Second, the budget protects and strengthens Medicare and Social Security, all while some congressional Republicans have threatened to cut them. The president has been crystal clear. These are more than programs. They are promises to American seniors. That's why the budget extends the life of Medicare trust fund by at least 25 years and rejects any effort to cut Social Security benefits. That is off the table, full stop. Third, this budget invests in America, boosting American manufacturing, making our community safer, strengthening our national security, cutting taxes for working families, and much more. That's the way you grow an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. And fourth, this budget reduces the deficit. Remember, this is not new to this president. He cut the deficit by $1.7 trillion his first two years in office. And the Inflation Reduction Act will reduce the deficit by hundreds of billions more. This year's budget will reduce the deficit by nearly $3 trillion over 10 years uh, by asking the wealthy and big corporations to begin to pay their fair share and by cutting wasteful spending on special interests. That includes by reforming our tax code to ensure no billionaire pays a lower tax rate than a teacher and a firefighter in this country. That's a clear contrast with congressional Republicans. Look, they talk a lot about cutting deficits, but let's get a few things straight today. Under the previous administration, they passed a $2 trillion unpaid for tax cut that was skewed to the wealthy and big corporations 
that absolutely exploded the deficit. And over the past few months, they've pitched plans that would add an additional $3 trillion to the deficit over 10 years. Now this morning, we get another proposal from the House Freedom Caucus. Let's talk about what it says about what they value. This is a plan that would have devastating consequences for our national security, cut the legs out from the middle class, endanger community safety, hurt our seniors, and cost manufacturing jobs. And here is the kicker. For all the talks of deficit reduction and fiscal responsibility, this would reduce the deficit by zero dollars, not a single penny. Also, tax cuts for the super wealthy can stay in place. So the contrast here is pretty simple. The president has laid out a detailed budget that will lower costs for families, protect Medicare and Social Security, and invest in America while reducing the deficit. And the very next day, congressional Republicans come out with a plan that would sell the middle class out in order to protect tax breaks for special interests and the super wealthy, while doing absolutely nothing to reduce the deficit. That's a debate we're eager to have. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me here uh, today. So I want to use my opportunity uh, to talk about the President's fiscal year 2024 budget uh, that was released yesterday, but uh, spend a little bit more time with the new jobs data uh, that came in earlier this morning uh, and the look ahead. So first I'll start with the budget. This budget builds on the solid economic gains of the first two years of this administration. The challenges faced by the American economy during the last time, these last two years, have been extraordinary. The dual human tragedies of COVID-19 and Russia's unprovoked war against Ukraine continue to reverberate through every facet of our country. Nevertheless, the U.S. economy has remained resilient. The United States ended 2022 with an economy that was 5 percent bigger in real terms than it was just before the pandemic, the strongest three-year performance of any G7 economy. Further. This morning, we learned that the employment rose by employment rose by 311,000 jobs in, in February, and that the labor force participation rate among private age Americans uh, rose 0.4 percentage points in January. It has not been this high since 2008. At the same time, we know that inflation remains too high. However, even there, we see signs of easing, as annual inflation, as measured by the CPI, has fallen for seven months in a row. We'll receive updated data on that on Tuesday. Taken together, these data are consistent with a robust recovery, one that has put us on a solid position to continue on a path forward towards sustainable growth that is more broadly shared. So the President's uh, 2024 budget builds on this growth in two very important ways. First, this budget is fiscally responsible, as Director Yolen just outlined. Second, the budget takes steps to further support our workforce and invest in human capital with policies such as paid leave and childcare that both increase our economic capacity and help to, to make it easier for workers to actually go to work and balance their responsibilities. So finally, a word about our budget forecast. So we finalized our forecast last November. Since then, data have become available, including today, and some of those data from, from 2022 and even earlier have been revised for technical reasons. So with every new release and revision of technical data, we've learned something new about the economy and have also revised our view of it. We've continued to learn a lot about just how conventional, unconventional this recovery has been. So if I, I think that if, if you told most conventional macroeconomists last June that we were about to get seven straight months of annual inflation uh, reduction, they would have told us that the unemployment rate would have to rise over that time. Instead, we've seen that the unemployment rate in February was the same as it was last June. And labor force participation rate is 0.3 uh, percentage points higher. I mention this to underscore that we are in unprecedented times. And if we were producing our Troika forecast today, we'd incorporate new data and information from the past few months. As I've emphasized repeatedly, we're confident we'll get back to steady and stable growth. However, the road there will continue to be a bumpy one. But let me end where I began. The strength of our recovery has put us on solid ground to weather economic shocks. And the President's 2024 budget presents a fiscally fair and responsible approach to continue the progress we've made so far to invest in America and meet our future challenges. Thank you. Okay, take a couple questions. Go ahead. 
I just wonder if we can get your reaction to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and whether you're concerned that other banks may fail as well. Um, so, sure. So, the most important thing that I will say here is that our Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary Yellen, is closely tracking uh, the developments with uh, S, the Silicon Valley Bank. Um, what I will emphasize as well is that our banking system is in, is in a fundamentally different place than it was, you know, a decade ago, and that the reforms that were put in a place back then uh, really provide the kind of resilience that we'd like to see. So we have every faith in our regulators. Um, and we can see that today, but uh, Secretary Yellen is closely tracking. And one more on that same topic. You know, the government obviously insures up to $250,000, but this bank served a lot of tech companies that obviously had a lot more uh, money in, stored with them. So how concerned are you that we could see a ripple effect just throughout this specific sector? So two things. One, I'll refer you to the FDIC for how they intend to handle. We know they're insured up to 250 and how they'll handle those with uh, balances above that. And the second, I just want to reemphasize that we are in a fundamentally different position. Uh, that, that you know, with the reforms of the global financial uh, crisis of 2007-2008, uh, we've put in place stress tests and other tools that our regulators have uh, to provide more resilience to our banking system. So, uh, you know, Secretary Yellen is watching this closely. Our regulators, we have every faith that they will be as well. Um, one for each of you, if, if you don't mind. Um, but first to just to follow up on, on Mary's question I think one thing that's different uh, in the wake of 2008 despite everything that's been put into place in the wake of Dodd Frank is interest rate risk is at a level right now that perhaps banks haven't been dealing with for a very long time do you feel comfortable that the banking industry writ large is both cognizant of the risk and prepared for it in a different way than maybe SVB was so what I would say is that our banking system ha has understands these kinds of heightened risks and that I have full faith and confidence in our, our regulators. Uh, you know, Secretary Yellen has been in conversation with our regulators, with the Federal Reserve, uh, with the Office of the Controller, so that they can be monitoring the situation. Uh, and they, they are very acutely aware of these risks <laughs> uh, more than we are, and we have full faith and confidence that they, they will be tracking. They have better tools than they had in 2008, and the banking sector has more resilience. And then, Director Young, you mentioned the House Freedom Caucus proposal. Look, I know you guys were able to reach a deal on approach in December. If this is a baseline that House Republicans, which now control the chamber, are working off of, where do you see overlap here? And, I, and I'm not talking necessarily about debt ceiling. I'm talking about further on fiscal negotiations that need to happen. I mean, it's a good question. The first step <laughs> is, this is why we do budgets. This is why we put it in black and white so the American people uh, can look at what uh, the president values, uh, what Congress values, um, and we owe it to them uh, to lay that out clearly. Uh, that's why this president's been actually pretty uh, strong about show us the plan. Uh, and it's not just a talking point. Uh, this is why we have a budget process, uh, because it is important uh, that people see what you mean. It's easy to say spending cuts. What does that mean? Well. At least some Republicans have told us what that means. Uh, before today, we heard defense was off the table. This says defense is on the table. Uh, so I think they have to figure out if this is the plan for all of them. Is this a few members? We don't know. That's why the House budget process, uh, they have to come out with a plan. They have to show if this is a plan that the majority of their conference can stand behind. Uh, because right now, the plan we have in front of us, uh, by some of them, uh, would cut critical programs uh, when we talk about non-defense spending, education, Department of Education, uh, Title I, IDEA, bipartisan programs, uh, transportation, housing vouchers. Uh, where are people supposed to live with a housing supply crunch? Uh, our national defense, while we're uh, supporting Ukraine, uh, while we're supposed to be countering China, uh, those are real key stark differences, and Phil, I think we're in the point of the program uh, where we both have to lay those out and make the case for the American people, and that's what we're doing, and the rubber hits the road in the appropriations process. Uh, and we'll see if they can pass those bills that live by uh, the outline that the Freedom Caucus has put out today. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see. Thanks, Steve. 
Thanks. And Director, if you could explain the President's thinking and, and, and his commitment going forward to ensuring the continued solvency of Social Security. His budget yesterday does not advance of any plan to adjust the payroll tax for wealthier individuals. You say in the document that he's interested in working with Congress. Can you explain whether that means that he hopes for a deal this year or in this Congress? So the deal is this president will not accept benefit cuts. You talk to someone like my 94 and a half uh, year old grandmother in South Louisiana. You call and tell her, because uh, I'm not, <laughs> Uh, that some people in D.C., uh, after she has spent uh, 40 or 50 years uh, working in this country, that some people uh, want to cut benefits that she has paid into and earned her whole life. What this budget says is this president is not interested in that conversation, uh, and his budget says not on his watch. Uh, so in contra I will say in contrast, we have people who want to cut it, and we think the existential crisis for Social Security is making sure that our American seniors know this president is going to stand behind them. If I could just follow up, I mean, the, the, the thinking is that Social Security only has about 12 more years of solvency left. This seems like a good opportunity, isn't it, with divided government for the president to make a proposal, hope for a compromise? He doesn't seem to be interested in doing that. Well, you assume the debate is from cutting no benefits and moving forward. We're trying to protect the benefits that are there now. I wish we were at the point of the debate where we could sit down and come up with proposals to extend. Uh, unfortunately, it is clear that some people want to go backwards. We are saying this president, which he has said over and over, will not accept benefit, cu benefit cuts in the Social Security program. Uh, so you're assuming all players are starting from the same place. They're not. Uh, and so this president has been very clear. His position is we will protect Social Security. Not making a proposal here to extend the solvency of Social Security. He's proposing not to accept any benefit cuts, but the Republican leaders say they're not proposing benefit cuts. Who are you going to listen to? You going to listen to the Freedom Caucus, who put out something different than what other people are saying? What we've said is one thing, one, Mondays, one thing is said, Tuesday, another thing said. We'll know if that is an ironclad commitment. We hope it is. But until we see a plan, Excuse us for wanting to see it in black and white uh, and see that it's supported by the majority of the conference. Thanks. Uh, just following up on that, in the budget, you did spend a lot of time talking about your proposals for Medicare, expressing concern about uh, Medicare solvency and um, claiming that the, the proposals that you're making will extend uh, Medicare for another 25 years or so. So why no proposal for extending Social Security's solvency, which is almost as dire? So, well, one, thanks for bringing up Medicare. You're right, we do have a proposal that would extend the life by at least 25 years. And we hope uh, our friends on the Hill will take us up on those proposals. Um, and I've been very clear, and the President has, we believe the greatest existential threat to Social Security today is those who want to cut it. So our position, his position is, that is not on the table, not on his watch, and that's what this budget says. So will the President have a proposal in the future for extending Social Security's lifeline so that people like your grandmother will be able to uh, get their full benefits come 10, 15, 20 years from now? Uh, I hope she's with us uh, uh, that long. I really do. Um, <laughs> but what this president will do is make sure he is a backstop and will stop uh, attacks on the program uh, from people who want to cut it. I want to follow up on that, but about Medicare, the proposal to keep Medicare solvent includes increasing taxes, which is something that Republicans have called a non-starter. So given that, where are the conversations happening about keeping Medicare solvent, given that it is dire and expected to run out in a matter of years as well, the trust fund? So remember, the budget writ large, this is the start of a conversation. Uh, this is a... So budgets, this is, this is the president's job. His job is, and Congress told all presidents, send us a budget. Show us what you would do, what you value. This president has done that. Now, it was, it, it was his choice to put four proposals that extended Medicare, and he'll work with anyone who wants to work with him to do that. Look, the, the uh, net income uh, tax was always supposed to go to Medicare. We're correcting something that should have happened a long time ago. 
Are we asking those making over 400000 to pay uh, more? We are to extend. Uh, and it has a dual benefit. It not only extends the trust fund life, it helps us reduce the deficit. So we think it's a good proposal, and we hope people take us up on it. Follow up with you on the debt limit. The president has been very clear he's not going to negotiate over increasing the debt limit. Will there be a parallel negotiation, though, with Republicans? In other words, would he agree to sign something that raises the debt limit unilaterally and then simultaneously have negotiations about potential cuts, which I understand you're still waiting to see the details of? Yeah, I've really tried in 20 years not to deal in uh, hypotheticals in this town. That is a good way to get oneself uh, in trouble. And uh, I've been in a lot of funding uh, debates over the years. They end differently every year. Uh, but guess what? They happen every year. So I know there's a lot more rhetoric around it with a new House majority. Uh, but we just work together and beyond. And most critics thought we could not find a path on a bipartisan basis in December, and we did. <laughs> Possibility, though, I understand you don't want to lock yourself into a parallel, into a hypothetical. But is it a possibility that you would have parallel negotiations? I will say we talk Democrats and Republicans every year. That is the only way to get government spending bills done. So that happens every year, and we expect it to happen this year. Can I ask you one more on SVP? It is the 19th largest bank in the U.S. It went down in about 40 hours. What do you say to Americans who have real concerns today about their hard-earned savings and money? Yeah, absolutely. And this is why we have the FDIC and other safeguards in place in our banking system. And what I would say to them is that our Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Secretary Yellen, the bank regulators, those who provide the guardrails and are safeguarding are, are closely watching and are prepared to use the tools that they need. The FDIC stepped in very quickly here. And that's what they were doing, was protecting the deposits of those up to 250000 and then they have a way to unwind the rest. So I will refer you to the FDIC. I will refer you to Treasury that is monitoring the developments in the system. But what I will say to is our banking system is far more resilient than it was in 2008. We learned a lot. Uh, we've got better tools specifically so that we can protect the, the important investments of of I'm going to take some from the back, and then we'll come back. Thanks, Karine. I, I have one for each of you. Um, picking up on that, you said you have full faith and confidence in our regulators. Regulators are, are those that, that work for the government. Do you have the full faith and confidence in the banking system writ large? Our, our banking system is fundamentally different because of the, the changes that we put in place in 2008. For example, they have to hold more capital. They undergo stress tests. So we know that we had to build more resilience into our banking system, which allows it to withstand these kinds of shocks. So I do have faith that we have the tools uh, to for, for this sector and for our regulators to be able to absorb. But you know, this is what we know today. But we do know that our banking system is in a fundamentally different place. Don't worry about the Again, we put in guardrails, which and our regulators have much more visibility into the banking sector than they did uh, a, a decade ago. And for Director Young, um, there's been a lot of talk in this room over the last this week and then last week as well about uh, Mexico and, and how to deal with cartels, transnational uh, traffic, <laughs> etc. There was additional money thrown into the budget, eight hundred million dollars worth for for ICE and CBP, more agents along the border, more money to take on fentanyl, et cetera. Is it an, is it an acknowledgment from the president that more needs to be done along the southern border and more needs to be done taking on these cartels? Look, the president has been clear. He has asked uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security to let me know, let him know what is needed. Uh, and that's why we're putting forth a robust request in fiscal year 24. Uh, but you're right, in December, the president told Congress, I need more than I originally asked uh, of you uh, months before, uh, and Congress gave us about half of what he asked for. Uh, so we have to ask, if we're all concerned about border security, are you going to resource uh, the, the men and women at the border to do their job? So we did not get everything we asked for in December. Uh, we're going to try again uh, with this budget. We're asking uh, for about $880 million more in CBP. We're asking for $4.7 billion in a contingency fund, acknowledging migration patterns change. So we're going to have triggers. If encounters hit a certain level, we'll uh, access more money. We think that's a responsible way to fund this. Um, so we're going to ask for the resources we need. 
and we continue to as assess. Uh, and we will uh, let Congress know, like we did last year, if that situation changes. Yeah. So I'm going to ask about the other thing today, the jobs report, uh, if I could. <laughs> um, so the average hourly wages in the jobs report is up 4.6 percent. Um, the CPI inflation is 6.4 percent. That, that it's inflation has been outpacing wages for about a year and a half. When can Americans expect that to reverse relief from that? So um, we did see that on an annual basis, we saw uh, some wage. Uh, the nominal wages went up lower than what we expect. We don't have the CPI report for this month, uh, but based on what we had in January. But I will highlight that real wages in January were higher than they were seven months ago. So we understand that inflation needs to come down. It's why it's the president's highest priority. Uh, we just got the blue chip forecast. Uh, was just released today from blue chip forecasters. They're expecting inflation to be easing to about 3.2 percent at the end of this year. We know that that is why it's so important for the Federal Reserve to have the independence. Uh, it is why the president is focused on lowering costs in his budget through the inflation reduction ask for Americans when it comes to health care, when it comes to child care, when it comes to higher education. But we are expecting to see this economy can, you know, with the, the labor market is robust. We are expecting to see inflation ease over the year. There may be bumps along the way, however. We know that we can't focus on any one month, but that, that is what most uh, forecasters are expecting. And on jobs, real quick, uh, on jobs, uh, the manufacturing lost 4,000 jobs. With the focus on manufacturing here, what happened? So again, uh, it, so yes, but we had one month, uh, and we don't like to focus on any one month. And if we look at the manufacturing growth overall, uh, they're higher today than they were uh, almost two years ago. We've seen more manufacturing growth in the last two years than we have in previous recovery cycles. Uh, what again, I want to emphasize, it's really important not to overfocus on any one month of data. But you, if we go back to the president's policies, if we look at the bipartisan infrastructure law, the the Chips and Science Act. Uh, those are even the Inflation Reduction Act in terms of the investments in the green uh, energy transition. All of those are going to bring the kind of manufacturing jobs that we know are so important to both rebuilding the infrastructure in this country, which we, which is very important for building our economic growth, building our economic capacity, and will offer those kind of manufacturing jobs, which are so important for a lot of American workers, especially those without a college degree. Go ahead, Phil. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for Director Young. Um, the first is, for the Pentagon, the President is requesting $842 billion. That's a 3.2% increase, 3 increase from last year, but inflation is at 6% currently. So how is that not a cut in real terms? Um, so remember, it matters what uh, we spend the resources on. This defense budget was built on the national defense strategy. Um, as you can imagine, uh, we tend to get from Congress a lot of things uh, that this administration did not prioritize. Uh, so frankly, uh, we had room in the base in which to prioritize to make sure we were taking care of the highest uh, priority uh, items for our national defense. Um, so that, that is the basic answer. It is about look under the hood. Uh, we believe we have the resources, uh, as I mentioned, to counter China uh, in defense and State Department and USAID. Uh, and it, it's the right level for uh, doing the right thing. We don't say, uh, I know people um, like to compare percentages from non-defense uh, and defense. It's about what the right level is to achieve uh, what we're trying to achieve. So we worked in lockstep with the Department of Defense to make sure we were uh, funding uh, the, the top priorities around the globe. Have said today, and the president has also said on numerous occasions that cuts to Social Security are off the table. Um, I'm wondering, though, for folks who are planning on retirement after 2035, when the Congressional Research Service estimates that that program could be approaching insolvency, you know, for folks who are expecting to retire, um, you know, in the next decades ahead, is what is the president's message to them? Can they rely on this program? Will it be around for them after they pay into it? Uh, remember, it takes it's going to take bipartisanship uh, in order to to deal with longer term issues here. Uh, and right now, unfortunately, uh, the debate is centered around the current benefits in the program. Uh, we have some, maybe uh, it's not the case, but we'll see when their budget comes out. Uh, but we have some who have said they want to cut Social Security. That is why this pre president and his budget made very clear uh, that he is not uh, going to allow that to happen on his watch. Uh, and that's full stop. But absolutely, uh, if 
if people want to uh, accept that as a reality uh, and talk about further proposals, uh, we're happy to engage in that. Can I go back to Silicon Valley Bank for a second? Um, there's a CEO of the White Combinator that has hundreds of its portfolio companies tied to the bank. And the CEO said that this is a, quote, extinction level event for startups if regulators and lawmakers don't act quickly to give it some liquidity. So I'm wondering if the administration <laughs> believes right now whether that kind of intervention is needed. I don't know if I'm supposed to say the word bailout, but <laughs> but what is the what is the White House thinking on that? What I would say is that Secretary Yellen is closely tracking. She's closely in touch with uh, Chair Powell, uh, with the uh, FDIC, with the Office of the Controller of the Currency. And so they are assessing the situation. They understand the importance of the stability within our financial sector. That is what their job is. And they have the tools that they need to ensure that we maintain stability in the financial sector. The president proposed 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave as part of his budget. What percentage of wages does he intend to replace, and how does he plan to pay for the proposed program? So uh, thank you for that. When we talk about uh, the president uh, reducing the deficit by over $3 trillion, it assumes uh, the investments in paid leave. It assumes the investment in child care. Uh, we believe uh, that when we reform the tax code, and ask the wealthiest in this country and large corporations uh, to pay what nurses and firefighters pay in this country, uh, that we can do things like paid leave. So those programs are already baked in. So our deficit projections, uh, when we say the $3 trillion, it assumes that we have paid for a 12-week paid leave policy. So we think we can do those investments fiscally responsible uh, by ensuring that we have fairness in the tax code. In the past, lawmakers have discussed this for a very long time. They all, uh, many Republicans and Democrats, have said that they believe in a paid leave program, but what they can't figure out is how to, to pay for it. Why not put forward a specific measure in this plan? Look, we are happy to talk about how to mix and match tax proposals and spending proposals. Uh, I think the important thing to know is in the budget, we've laid out several uh, revenue sources, several tax policies. Um, and, you know, absolutely, if, if some of the proposals get mixed and matched with certain things, uh, we're open to that. I think the, the key thing to leave here with is we've put a suite of proposals for that have enough revenue, uh, more than enough, to do paid leave and the other proposals uh, that the president has put forward. Because this president, uh, rather than talk about fiscal responsibility, has actually put forward budgets that say we should pay for what we spend. And as a matter of fact, we should pay for what we spend and reduce the deficit at the same time. Great, thanks. Uh, first for Dr. Rouse, um, with regard to uh, the jobs numbers today, are you concerned that rising interest rates is going to torpedo the progress in the labor market and that there's a disconnect between how the Fed looks at this and how the White House looks at this? So what I would say is this, look, this job, Oh, sorry. This jobs report, yeah, that, that does sound different. Um, this jobs report reflects that we have an economy that remains resilient. Um, and the president respects the independence of the Fed and understands they have a dual mandate. So their dual mandate is both price stability and maximum employment. So uh, I have full faith that they are focused on those two goals. What I will say is that the resilience that we see in this labor market uh, is, defies uh, expectations of traditional macroeconomists. And so we are, you know, it's not foregone that we have to see, uh, you know, a big spike in unemployment in order to bring down uh, inflation. As I mentioned before, I don't think any macroeconomist would have expected we would have seen the easing over the past seven months that we've seen without seeing some give uh, in the unemployment uh, in the labor market. So, uh, you know, we fully expect that we know there will be bumps along the way, uh, but we fully expect that we will see a transition to an economy that is more stable. Uh, and where there's more st sustainable growth. Uh, and, you know, our forecast, the forecasts of private, invest uh, for private forecasters suggest that inflation should come down meaningfully over the course of this year and will eventually get back to a more stable uh, situation. Do you think rates are too high? So what I would say is that we see an economy that is quite resilient. Uh, and we still see, and we still see, but we st also understand that inflation is too high. So the Federal Reserve has to take the actions it needs to take. Um, and um, so we have the confidence that they will do that while also trying to achieve that soft or softish landing. 
uh, which suggests that they will try to maintain the momentum in the, the labor market in particular, but in the economy, while bringing inflation under control. Just very briefly for Director Young, you've been asked multiple times about the future of Social Security, and <clears throat> most of your answers have focused on Republicans wanting to cut benefits now. Keeping that context in mind, will the President make a proposal at some time during his administration to help ensure that Social Security will exist for people who are retiring, as was already asked, in 10 years? So the President has supported proposals that would extend Social Security. He has not walked away from those proposals. I'll remind everyone this is the fiscal year 24 budget. Uh, it is one year. That does not mean that every policy that uh, the, the president and then candidate uh, supports will be reflected in one budget year. Um, and he absolutely uh, has supported uh, policies that would extend Social Security. Right now, unfortunately, uh, we believe the, the thing he has to protect against most is those who want to cut it. Uh, so you're right. This is about a contrast. Uh, and we're starting from a place of having to protect Social Security, uh, so that is what is reflected here. Peter. Director Young, do you think there is any wasteful government spending? Uh, Peter, th this is why we have uh, $1.6 billion uh, f to go after fraud, uh, mostly in the unemployment insurance area. You probably heard the White House talk about this proposal. Uh, it ensures, you've heard the President talk about making sure IG stay on the beat. Uh, that is a difference from the last administration who uh, fired some of our IGs. They go after wasteful spending and are very helpful pointing out to us in Congress what wasteful spending is. Uh, that is why you see that proposal uh, to make sure that we go after fraud and waste in government programs and after crime syndicates who are abusing programs that should be there for those Americans who need it. So no. But it, the criticism from Republicans in Congress is that this budget just makes the government too big. You don't think so? We would not have a $1.6 billion proposal to go after fraud and waste and crime syndicates uh, if we didn't think that there was some reform uh, and cops on the beat like the IGs needed. So I did not say that. I said we have a proposal um, in which to go after it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I have a couple things at the top and then we can go into questions. So as you all know, in, uh, uh, I guess you guys all saw, President Biden is uh, meeting with President Ursula von der Leyen of the European Commission, uh, which is happening currently as we're standing here, as I'm standing here and you all are sta sitting there, uh, transatlantic <laughs> economic <laughs> issues. I trying to be a little bit more smooth about that, and it was not smooth. Okay, transatlantic economies, uh, economic issues will be the central focus of the meeting, including our Inflation Reduction Act and the EU's uh, Green Deal Industrial Plan. We also expect them to discuss our continued partnership to support Ukraine and the Windsor framework. Coming out of the meeting this afternoon, we hope to be able to begin negotiations on a targeted critical minerals agreement and a dialogue on subsidy transparency. We also hope to be able to jointly commit to a deadline for finalizing negotiations on the global arrangement on sub sustainable steel and aluminum. Uh, we announced yesterday, as you all saw, that the President and the First Lady uh, are going to, uh, are looking forward and are going to be headed to Ottawa, Canada on March 23rd to the 24th. And so President Biden will reaffirm the United States commitment to the, U to the U.S. Canada partnership and promote our shared security, shared prosperity, and shared values. While there, President Biden will meet with Prime Minister Trudeau. They'll discuss a wide range of topics, including defense cooperation, strengthening our supply chain resilience, our efforts to combat climate changes, as well as regional and global challenges like supporting Ukraine, addressing irregular migration, and combating the synthetic opioid crisis. While there, President Biden will also address the Canadian Parliament. And uh, as you all know, we will have more to share as we get closer to the travel dates. One thing that I wanted to share uh, or speak to uh, this, this afternoon is basically what we have seen uh, this past um, this past couple of weeks. So I just want to take a step back a moment uh, and uh, really call out the shameful, hateful, and dangerous attacks that we have been seeing uh, on the LGBTQI community, uh, as we've seen this week, as I said, and also last week. Look, it started with a speaker at a conservative conference 
calling for the eradication of transgender people, language that not a single national Republican leader has condemned. In Iowa and Tennessee, Republicans are now calling for legislation to attack gay marriage and protections for same-sex couples. In Florida, just Florida alone, Republicans introduced 20 bills, 20 bills on a single day to roll back the rights of LGBTQ community. One of those bills would give the state the right to remove kids from their parents just because that kid is transgender. And just think about that. Just think about a kid who's sitting at home in this community who's listening and hearing elected officials talking about how they want to take away their rights or how they want to even threaten their parents with felony charges for seeking health care for their children. These kids are sitting at home having to listen to people who are supposed to protect them and their freedom saying these horrific, ugly, despicable things. So, so far this year, we have seen more than 450 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced at the state level. You've heard me say that before. Amounting to a record number of anti-LGBTQ bills in our country's history. Guys, today is day 70. It is day 70 of 2023. The same leaders that tout freedom apparently don't extend their love for freedom if they disagree with who you are, who you love, or how you parent. It's government overreach at its worst, taking away rights from the vulnerable, all to distract from a deeply unpopular agenda that caters to the ultra-rich. As the president has made clear time and time and time again, you have heard him say this, not just as president, but also as vice president, also as, as a senator throughout his career. He believes that everyone in this country should live with the safety and dignity. With the safety and dignity. There is no asterisk over the word freedom in this country. We will not hesitate to call out this behavior. If I have to do this, or we have to do this, or the president has to do this every week, we will. And I'll just, I'll just say what the president has said over and over again when it comes to LGBTQ plus community, when it comes to vulnerable communities across the country that are constantly being attacked. We have their back. The president has their back. And that will continue. So now the week ahead. This evening, the president will travel to Wilmington, Delaware. On Sunday, the president will return to the White House. On Monday, the president will travel to San Diego, California, to meet with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese of Australia and Prime Minister Sunak of the United Kingdom and discuss the Australia-United Kingdom-United States Partnership, also known as AUKUS. The president will also participate in bilateral meetings with Prime Minister Sunak and also Prime Minister Albanese. On Tuesday, the president will travel to Monterey Park, California. The president will discuss his efforts to reduce gun violence. Then the president will travel to Las, Ve Las Vegas. On Wednesday, the president will discuss his plan to lower prescription drug costs. In the evening, the president will travel to the White House from uh, Las Vegas. We will have more to share on St. Patrick's Day, one of the president's favorite holidays in the days ahead, as you all know. It'll be a lot to celebrate on March 17th. With that, Song Ming, you want to kick us off? I have two quick questions. Sure. Um, will the president sign the legislation that would declassify information about the origins of COVID? So look, um, I know that it was just passed, if I remember if I remember correctly, it was just passed out of the House today, right? So we're taking a look at the bill. Uh, we have continued to share information, as I've mentioned many times before, with uh, members of Congress. And as you know, the first few months of the president's administration, he, uh, he, uh, he came into office. He directed the intelligence community to de declassify information, uh, assessing or, uh, COVID origins, and to make that report uh, public to, uh, to, to Americans' people, to the American people, because we know and he understands how important it is to get to the bottom of COVID oranges. We will, origins. We will continue to use every tool to figure out what happened here uh, while also protecting uh, classified information. Again, we're going to take a look at the bill. I just don't have anything to share on how we're going to move forward at this time. Also passed it unanimously. So why would President Biden not something that we literally gonna, got no opposition in Congress? I totally understand. It is the right of the President of the United States to look at the legislation that are that is going to be coming before him, uh, and uh, we'll have more to share. And one quick uh, clarification request on what he said earlier today. Um, 
He was asked about Saudi Arabia and Iran reestablishing diplomatic relations, and he said the better the relations between Israel and their Arab neighbors, the better for everybody. Can you just clarify what he said? So look, uh, as it relates to Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, we, are, we are aware of the reports and would uh, certainly refer you to the Saudis as they are uh, uh, clearly uh, came together with this plan and they will give, provide more details. But generally speaking, to your question, look, we welcome any efforts to help end the war in Yemen and de-escalate tensions in the Middle East region. That is one of the reasons why the President, you saw him travel uh, in over the summer uh, to, to have those conversations. De-escalation and diplomacy together with deterrence are key pillars of the policy that the President, uh, that President Biden uh, uh, put out, uh, outlined during his, uh, his visit in July in the region. So again, de-escalation, uh, tensions in the Middle East clearly is a priority and he welcomes that. Thank you, Corinne. Um, still on the Saudi-Iran deal, you and other officials have often said that the JCPOA is just not a focus right now for the administration. Is this still the case in light of the Chinese broker deal that renews ties between Saudi and Iran? And should China be able to expand the Saudi-Iran deal to bring Iran to return to JCPOA? Would the administration support that? So our opposition, as we have stated the last couple of months as it relates to JCPOA, has not changed. Uh, it is not our focus right now. Uh, it is not on the agenda. And I'll just leave it there. We've been pretty consistent on that. And so that hasn't changed. Follow up on Somin's question. Did the president just misheard the question? I, I'm still confused uh, with your. Experience. I mean, there's no confusion. I just laid out how we feel about uh, how we feel about the de-escalating de tensions in the Middle East. We've been very clear about that. The president laid out uh, his plan uh, as it uh, uh, during his trip. The pillars of the policy uh, during his trip in July. It's just that hasn't changed, and that still stands. Okay. Great, thanks. I just want to emphasize: there's high interest in knowing if. The bill to declassify the order you've covered. Do you think you'll get an answer by the end of the day? I, we're we're going to look at the bill. I can't give a timeline. That's something that our team here has to take a look uh, at the bill that has been that has, as you know, has been uh, gone through Congress and just take a look at it and we'll get back to you all. I don't have a timeline on that. Okay. I want to follow up on the comments uh, you made at the top and you highlighted Florida as one of the places mm -hmm. in which um, LGBTQI rights are under attack. Today, Ron DeSantis, Governor Ron DeSantis, said that Florida is where woke goes to die. He also said of the COVID response, we were right and they were wrong um, in reference to this administration in the past one. Can you respond to any of that? Okay. Can, say, can you say the first one again, the first question? So can you respond to Governor Ron DeSantis in Iowa today who okay. said Florida is where woke goes to die? So here's what I have to say. When Republicans, extreme Republicans, these MAGA Republicans, uh, don't agree um, with an issue or with policy, they don't bring forth something that's going to either have a, a good faith conversation. They go to this conversation of woke. But that is not actually policy. That what, they, what that turns into is hate. What it turns into is despicable policy, um, and it's just not the way we're going to move forward. This is not protecting freedoms. This is not having a good faith conversation on how we can move the country forward. This is about attacking, we're talking about attacking young kids and their parents because of how they view themselves, because of how they see themselves, because of how they want to live. Kids and their parents, what does that have to do with anything about being woke? That is just hate, and it is, uh, it is shameful. It is shameful, and we're going to call it out. And like I said, the president is going to continue to say we have the back of, the, of that community or any vulnerable community. Do you have any response to him saying we were right and they were wrong? Obviously, Florida, one of the states that lifted COVID restrictions on the earlier side. So let me just remind you all, and you guys wrote about this very early on in the administration. When this president walked in to this administration, thousands of people were dying of COVID. The last administration did not put forward a comprehensive plan on how we were going to deal with COVID, on how we were going to have shots in arms. <laughs> This president, along with Democrats in Congress, passed the American Rescue Plan, which actually helped turn the, the economy back on because the economy was tanking, grow the economy so that we didn't leave anybody behind, got people shots in arms, made sure that vaccines were available for free to the American people, making sure that more than 200 million people got vaccines, got, became fully vaccinated. That's what this president did. 
this is how he moved forward to make sure that we're we're sitting, we're, well, you guys are sitting here, we're standing here, and we're able to sit next to each other. Most of us, majority of us don't have masks on. Many of us are, be, are able to, who have kids, our kids are back at school. When we came into this administration, schools were closed. Small businesses were shutting down. So, you know, we just talked about the budget, the president's budget plan, about his values, what he sees the value for the American people. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about how we're going to deliver for the American people. And uh, very quickly, Karina, one more topic. Democrats now are joining the calls for President Biden to go to East Palestine. He has said he plans to go. What are the plans for him to go? Why hasn't he gone? So I, I've been asked this question multiple times, as you know, uh, Kristen. Look, um, the president, when, um, when the chemical spill happened on February 3rd, you saw the federal government act right away. Within hours, you saw the EPA on the ground, DOT was on the ground, and the president made sure that we responded on the federal level uh, so that the people of East Palestine were made whole again. I don't have, uh, I don't have a, a trip to, to announce at this time, uh, again, this has been a priority for the president. He's been updated very regularly. He's spoken to the governors of Pennsylvania, the governor of Ohio. Uh, his team has been on the ground multiple times. You've seen the EPA dir director administrator uh, go down to um, uh, go down to to the to see the community to see for himself uh, what has occurred. That he's been there about three times, uh, and you have seen multiple agencies on the ground also making sure that we make the community whole again, and also holding to account Norfolk, uh, Suffolk. Understood. But now Southern, that all of that, all of the, now that all of that is in place, Democrats are saying it's time for him to get down. Here. And he said when he was asked the question that he will be there. I don't have a, a timeline for you. The president answered this question directly when he was asked a couple of days, and he said he's looking uh, forward to go down, going down. Just don't have a timeline to share. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have any update on when a decision will be announced on the Willow Project? And uh, can you confirm that the president was participating in conversations on the project this week? Um, how actively involved has he been? Well, I think I confirmed, uh, 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 I don't know, I, earlier this week that he had uh, discussions with the delegations of Ala in, in, in Alaska. So I did confirm that he has had those conversations. Look, as, as I said also on, on that day, that this process is led by the Department of Interior. They are the ones who make the decision, the Secretary of Interior. So I would point you uh, for any specifics or timeline or details on that uh, to uh, Interior. Um, I, I know that uh, Chair Rouse said that uh, Secretary Yellen is actively engaged in uh, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, issue. I'm wondering, has the president been briefed on this? Has he talked to Secretary Yellen? What is his involvement uh, today? That's a good question. I haven't had a chance to, to speak to the president. I just, as you know, this has been reoccurring reoc over the last uh, couple of hours. What I can say for sure, and certainly I'm going to let the economist who was in front of you all speak to this, uh, let her word sit, but I just follow up and say Treasury is certainly tracking those recent, recent developments and remains in touch with regulators. Uh, and so uh, for any specifics or details on that, certainly I would refer you to uh, Department of Treasury. I just This has been developing over the last couple of hours. I just haven't had a chance to, to speak to him about it. One quick follow-up. I know two of my colleagues asked about this. I think the reason that there's confusion about the president's comments earlier today is because he was asked about a relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia and brought up Israel. Obviously, Israel is a neighboring country, but it's not party to, to this uh, new arrangement. Did the president just mishear the question? Did you have a chance I have to, to be very him? honest. I didn't hear the question that was posed to him, and I didn't hear how he answered it. So it, I would need to hear it for myself before I can give you um, uh, an answer. What I can say to you is what, more broadly, how we see the relationship and how important it is to de-escalate de de uh, in the in the region at this time and uh, in the Middle East, and so that's why the president. One of the reasons that one of the things that was on the president's agenda was just that when he went in July, he went to Israel, as you know, he went to Saudi Arabia, as you know, uh, and it was important. Uh, it was important uh, uh, trip uh, to have. I, I just have to go back and see exactly what he said. I just want to make sure I say it, the right, I respond to you in, a, in the right way. But what I can speak to is more broadly how he sees uh, this relationship. And just one last quick one. Obviously, on Monday, he's going, as you said, to California uh, in connection with the AUKUS deal. This was something that uh, particularly upset the French when it was announced um, months ago. I'm wondering if the president plans any outreach. I know he recently spoke with McCormick. Yeah, I was going to say he recently, yeah. 
ahead of this or after this event, if there's anything uh, he might do? No, it's a good question. As you know, he spoke to uh, President Macron just last week. I uh, don't have any uh, any future or upcoming uh, conversations uh, to be had uh, around this trip. Do you know if Marcus was brought up on that call? Uh, I, I know we had a readout. I just don't, outside of that, I don't know if uh, I don't have anything else to share. Okay. Good, Phil. Thanks, Reen. Um, one of my colleagues had a pretty extraordinary interview with an Iranian uh, or a U.S. citizen that's being held uh, in Iran now for several years, appealing to the president for his help in securing his release. Uh, I'm wondering if the president is aware of, of that interview happening from inside the Indian prison, um, and also if he's willing to meet with the Namazi family uh, in the wake of uh, the plea from uh, Siamak Namazi. So I can say that, uh, we, look, we don't have any meetings to preview at this time or today, but I can confirm that senior officials uh, from both the White House and also the State Department uh, meet and consult regularly with the Namazi family, and we will continue to do so until uh, this unacceptable detention ends and CMAC is re reunited with his family. That is certainly uh, the President's commitment uh, and our commitment here. Great. I think you had a okay. okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank uh, hopefully, I'll see you guys on the trip. If not, next week. Call.